was no meat, we ate fowl. And there was no fowl, we ate crawdad. And when there was no crawdad to be found, we ate sand. You ate what? We ate sand. You ate sand? That's right. Upstairs, that's my mom uh, weaving. She she weaves on a loom, you know, like the old timey way. Uh, the women in my family have been doing it for uh, what six generations now, uh, and I live in the basement apartment of their house. So <laughs> her looming workshop is right above my head. But uh, yeah, what are you gonna do? Um, so anyway, uh, how y'all doing? <laughs> I hope you're doing good. Uh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm here with uh, Brad, our resident shape-shifting vision casting leader, and Drago, our resident Russian dog. It's a matter of science, isn't it, gentlemen? Drago is the most perfectly trained athlete ever. Drago is a look at the future. Say, guess that 90s hair band from the intro and you'll win a prize. Tell them what they'll win, Brad. If you missed that 90s hair band from the Book of Levi video, here's the answer. So today we're going to be talking about heresy. Now, heresy is a word that's uh, thrown around a lot, uh, too, too much actually. Um, heresy uh, basically is, is a deviation from orthodoxy. What is heretical is a deviation from what is orthodox. <laughs> Now, in order for it to deviate, it must start in orthodoxy. So all heresies start in what is orthodox. Um, in the uh, New Testament, when uh, Peter and Paul talk about false teachers, and Jude also, they talk about these false teachers who arise in the church. Uh, they don't uh, attack the church from the outside, but they're within the within the um, within the walls, so to speak. And so they start at a place of orthodoxy, and then they 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 deviate from that. Um, so in order for something to be a heresy, it must deviate from what is what is orthodox. Now that's why I don't consider, like for instance, uh, Mormonism a heresy. I consider it a, a cult because Mormonism doesn't even start out in in orthodoxy. I mean, I think we'd all have to agree that at the at the, at the very uh, fundamental foundation of Christian orthodoxy is the doctrine of monotheism, that there is one God. From that springs all other orthodoxy, all other doctrine. And uh, the Mormons don't even have that right. They are polytheists, so they're not heretical Christians. They're a totally different um, uh, entity. They're not orthodox at all, and yet they uh, they uh, they operate under the name of Christianity, which makes them a cult, not a, not a heresy. Um, heresies start in what is um, what is orthodox. So um, many times when you hear heresy taught. They don't just come right out and start with the heresy. They start out in, in what's orthodox, and then they travel along uh, a certain point, and then they veer away from what is orthodox. Now, in, in Christianity, for the last 2,000 years, from the days of the apostles until now, there has been an orthodox teaching of, of justification, sanctification, and, and glorification. This is the bedrock of Christianity. And anything that differs from that is, is heresy. It's heresy within Christianity, not in true Christianity, but in the, under the name of, of Christianity. And, and because of that, it can be hard to spot, like I said, because they, they start out at orthodoxy, and then at one point they veer left or or right. But now, at the center of Christian uh, orthodoxy is the doctrine of justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is we are declared righteous in the sight of God. And that's the doctrine, the doctrine of justification, and it is derived directly from Scripture. We'll be uh, looking at that um, tonight. Now, justification is accomplished 
It's not just arbitrary. God doesn't just uh, point at people and say, you're righteous, you're righteous, you're righteous. He's not an unjust judge. He's not an arbitrary judge who just uh, uh, declares people righteous. Unrighteous people righteous. Wicked people righteous. Unholy people holy. He doesn't do that. Uh, he accomplishes uh, justification through the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Where Christ Jesus died my death. He paid the price for me. Um, he, I owed God a debt of death, and Christ paid that for me. He died as me. And because he died as me, I can now be justified by his righteousness. Because not only did he substitute for me in my death, he substituted for me in my life. He lived a completely righteous life, pleasing to God. And because I have faith in him, God gives me uh, justification, gives me the righteousness of Christ. So that's the doctrine of justification. Sanctification is that doctrine of justification being worked out here on the earth uh, in, in, in creation. Uh, we are justified in heaven, uh, declared righteous by God in heaven. In his sight, we are justified. However, here on the earth, we don't look too much like Christ, do we? Uh, uh, we, we look a lot like more like our, our father Adam than we do our Redeemer uh, Christ. So sanctification is the process where the Holy Spirit makes us like Christ, makes us holy. To sanctify means to set apart or to make holy. So God is making people holy here on the earth. We're already holy in heaven in God's sight. But he's making us holy here on the earth. This is sanctification. Then we come to glorification, which is a future promise, which is what happens in heaven when everything is made right in heaven, when, when justification and sanctification complete themselves in heaven. So uh, uh, that's glorification. Now, this is the bedrock of Christian faith. Uh, it's 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 what makes a, the Christian faith the Christian faith. This really is what you have to believe to be part of the Christian faith. Uh, it's been that way for 2,000 years. Well, anyway, today we've got uh, the pastor of uh, South African Church Kingdom Light. His name is uh, Sean Basson. I think I'm saying that right. And uh, he's going to be teaching heresy to us. And in this, we're, we're going to kind of see the anatomy of a heresy or how a heresy um, comes to be, um, how it uh, uh, develops in a, in a teaching, a teaching that starts out in orthodoxy, a teaching that starts out like John MacArthur or any other preacher that we would say is, is an orthodox uh, preacher. Uh, it can start out like that, but then it goes left or right. So I think we'll see that here uh, in this sermon from uh, Sean Basson. So here we go. And uh, so turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, uh, we're going to get into... A little bit of a few things this morning. Now you're going to notice that he says turn to Colossians 2, but it's going to take him a long time to get to Colossians 2. He's going to spend a lot of time setting up a paradigm for Colossians 2. So by the time he gets to the text, he's going to have everything nice and laid out for the text to fit nicely into what he's been telling you for the last, uh, well, it's like 15 minutes he talks before he gets to the text. It's all about setting up the paradigm and then putting the verse into that um paradigm. Instead of just reading the text and then telling us what the text says, he's going to tell you what the text says first and then shove the verse into that explanation. So the context of where we're going today um, and why we got a bit of the board up, going a bit of old school is, since the beginning of this year, God's been really speaking to us about the finished work of the cross. It's something that we believe, it's something that's part of who we are, understanding the word, understanding the grace, understanding who we are in Christ. And when we quote the scripture of Acts 17, it says, in him we live and move and have our being. You'll hear me speak about that scripture for days on end, for months on end. We're going to be talking about this from every different angle. Because to understand how to live and move in him, I need to have find that my being is in him. Who I am. I am in Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives. That means you did. Hello, all you dead people. It says in Romans chapter 12, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. That word presenting is to expose and show forth as the dead. It's no longer I that live, but Christ. So we had three scriptures thrown at us pretty quick here. The first one is Acts 17, verse 28. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. Men of Athens, 
I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor does he worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So Paul here is talking about all creation. Every creature lives and moves and has its being in God. Now what, what did Sean say again? In him we live and move and have our being. You'll hear me speak about that scripture for days on end, for months on end. We're going to be talking about this from every different angle. Because... To understand how to live and move in him, I need to have find that my being is in him. Who I am. I am in Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives. That means you did. Hello, all you dead people. So Paul wasn't saying that in Christ we live and move and have our being, but in the Creator, all of us, all of creation, live and move and have our being. It might seem like I'm mincing words here and making too big of an issue of this. I mean, don't we have our being in Christ as Christians? Yes, but uh, Sean is about to make a big deal out of the words Paul used here in a text that he is taking out of context. Um, so already we see that this is a pastor who has no problem taking scripture out of context. So that was uh, Acts 17, 28. Paul says, all creation, not Christians, although Christians are part of creation, live and move and have our being in God. There is no life for anything without God. That is what Paul was saying. Uh, so then he threw um, Romans 12, 1 at us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is in Romans chapter 12, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. That word presenting is to expose and show forth as the dead. Now that word present is the Greek word peristemi, and it means to set alongside. It's the same word used for parable, something that is set beside something else. So Paul says to lay our lives beside something as a sacrifice. Lay it beside what? With the gospel. We have been justified by faith, which is what he was talking about in Romans 11. If we have been justified by faith, then our lives ought to reflect that justification. Our lives ought to be a parable of that justification, an example, an illustration of that uh, justification. Our lives, our bodies, what we do in our flesh. Present your bodies, he said, as a living sacrifice. In our flesh, in our created flesh, we become a parable or an illustration of the justification that is taking place in heaven. This is the doctrine of sanctification. No longer I that live. But Christ did live. That means you did. He seems to be caught up in this idea of death. He, he's taking it extremely literally. It sounds like he's getting into an ancient heresy known as Gnosticism, which was a kind of dualism that, that said Jesus was a spirit being and that we become spirit beings because spirit is good, flesh is bad. Uh, we'll get more into that uh, as he goes on. Okay, now what was the third passage he threw at us? Uh, Galatians 2.20. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, 
I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So Paul here is talking about the imputation of Christ's righteousness uh, to Paul's account, or, or justification, the doctrine of justification. He says, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. Well, how is that possible? Well, he told us in verse 16. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The only thing the law produces is death. It does not produce righteousness. Now, Paul was a Jew. He was of the law or of death. And, and he got death, and yet he lives. He said, I died according to the law. I got what was coming to me, and yet here I am. How can this be? He was crucified with Christ. Christ was his substitute. Christ became sin in the sense that he became Paul. Christ became sin in the sense that he became me. When God looked at Christ on the cross, when God looked at Christ on the cross, he saw Paul. He saw me. Christ himself had no sin. Uh, Hebrews uh, 7.26 makes this plain. Such a high priest truly befits us, one who is holy, innocent, undefiled, set apart from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. So the law looked at Paul and said, you deserve to die. Paul says, I did die when Christ died. And since Christ was raised from the dead, so was Paul. Because Jesus not only paid Paul's debt of sin, he gave Paul his righteousness. He didn't just clear the books of sin, he deposited righteousness into our account. This is the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, imputation of righteousness, and justification by faith. The church has believed it for 2,000 years now, and it is taken directly from this text in Galatians. But, but Sean is going to be saying something different, but he, he's being sneaky about it. Heresy is sneaky. In the Bible, uh, it talks about heresy as being a very, very sneaky thing. Uh, we're not going back to Adam. We're not going back to Adam. It's like, oh, we want to have what Adam lost. <laughs> no, Adam wants to have what we have. Is that Christ never lived inside of Adam. Adam never became a part of God. <laughs> a part of God. That's, that's very problematic uh, language. We don't become a part of God in the sense that we become part of his substance. We are partakers of the righteousness of Christ. This is what the Bible teaches now. Maybe it's just a, maybe we just said it weird. I try not to be too dogmatic because sometimes we say things in a weird way, not meaning it the way it sounded. So I'm, I'm just going to give him the benefit of the doubt for now. Adam was still the created being. Jesus Christ was the second Adam and he was a life-giving spirit. Now, he is referred to as the second Adam in Romans 5. Uh, through Adam, death entered the world. Thus, Paul said, I deserve to die because I'm um, of Adam. But through Christ, life entered the world. Thus, Paul said, I live. But Jesus was not a life-giving spirit. That's what he said. Jesus is a life-giving spirit. This is starting to sound a lot like Gnosticism. So he was the lost Adam. So there's a context of understanding that what Jesus did on the cross was final. So when we talk about the finished work of the cross, we want to look at what that means. For me to understand my being in Christ, I need to understand the fullness of what that is. And So he, he covers the substitutionary motifs in the Old Testament pretty well, showing us how the prophets and the law were teaching us about this doctrine of justification to come. It's pretty orthodox, so I'm going to skip ahead to where things get uh, dicey. Do you know... It's interesting in Matthew, it says there are 42 generations unto Christ. But if you count them, there are only 41. So when you see genealogies in the Word and you're like, oh, this is a boring piece, let's skip this. You're missing something. Because right there is something that is very significant 
about a 42nd generation that's not lived yet. Now, this is, this is very slippery. What did he say about the text of Matthew again? Interesting in Matthew, it says there are 42 generations unto Christ. Actually, it doesn't. It doesn't say there are 42 generations. It says there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. There, there's a difference from Abraham to David, from David to exile, from exile to Messiah. 14 generations in each period. Uh, we, we don't count the names as the generations. Matthew knew very well what he was doing. 14, 14, 14. Now, Christ did give life to a whole generation, as prophesied uh, in Isaiah 53. But Sean here is going to say something weird. It all has to do with the heresy he's about to slip into this teaching. It's a spiritual generation, the generation of Christ in the fullness of sonship. Because when he was stabbed in his side, what, flo flo uh, um, what poured out? Blood and water. Christ gave birth to a generation that would be spiritual, that would be for all eternity by his blood in the fullness of what he did. So when we understand the cross, again going back to Acts 17, in him we live and move and have our being. Now, as we've covered, Paul was talking about our flesh, about all creation having life from God. When the lamb was in the Passover and the lamb was a sin offering, it still did not change you. You came with your lamb, but you went back home still a murderer, a rapist, a cheater, a liar, full of fear, full of condemnation, still. No wonder Romans chapter 8 says now, because we're in Christ, there's no more condemnation. Why? Because you changed the day you got born again. Now, that, that's not what makes the sacrifice perfect in Romans 8. Let's look at it, because it's going to be relevant to what he's uh, going to be talking about later. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Right? Like Paul said in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. All sin in the law could produce was death, not life. Only righteousness produces life. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, Sean said we have no condemnation because the sacrifice changed us, but that is not what the text says. The text says the sacrifice was sufficient to fulfill the law of righteousness, and the reason that the sacrifice was made was so that we might be changed, so that we might, in our flesh, fulfill the righteous requirement of the law through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. These are the doctrines of justification and sanctification. We are justified in heaven, we are sanctified on the earth, and we are sanctified in our flesh by the Holy Spirit. It might seem like I'm mincing words here with what Sean is saying, but I'm not. Uh, you'll see. You changed. By his blood, you have been washed so that you are free. You've been set free. From the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death does not apply to us anymore. The law of sin and death says if you sin, you die. We don't die, even though we still sometimes sin. Why is that? Because we have been crucified with Christ. We are now bound to righteousness. Not to the law of sin and death, but to the righteousness of Christ, which is eternal because his life is eternal. If we look at being born again, if we look at the context of what that is, we, we all know it. You've been around it for, too long, for, uh, for a long time. But a caterpillar being turned into a butterfly, it's not a fat caterpillar flying with beautiful wings. Right? It's total transformation. It doesn't look like the caterpillar at all. There's no, nothing of it. Now, we're going to read Colossians 2 now about the cutting off, but the very context is you got born again. So he, he's still setting up the context of Colossians 2, or, or he says he is. Uh, what he's going to do is, is obfuscate the doctrine of uh, regeneration. That means rebirth. So what I was 
the old me died and I got born again new beginning all old there's no I, I got up and I'm still like my sin nature I got no there's a brand new nature in Christ now what he's doing here is mixing the doctrines of regeneration and sanctification rebirth uh, regeneration is rebirth in a sense See, we are all born of Adam. Paul covers this in Romans 5. All are born of Adam, every single person. And everyone born of Adam will die. This is the curse of sin and death. The only way for someone to not die is to not be born of Adam. They must be reborn of someone else. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that one must be reborn of the Spirit. We have Adam's nature at birth. We have his curse. We have his sentence of death upon us. Uh, we have Adam's anointing, as it were. But when we get saved, we receive the Holy Spirit, which marks us as no longer belonging to Adam, but rather belonging to Christ. We are reborn, no longer in Adam, but in Christ. And that is done once and for all eternity. Once one is reborn in Christ, one will always be in Christ. He loses none of his own. That's John chapter 6. It's a once for all deal. Justification is a once for all deal. Because what, God, what, God, because what God declares is eternal, you see. When God declares you justified, you are justified. Now, sanctification, which is what Paul is writing about in detail in Romans 8, which Sean just referenced, is a process in which our lives here in the flesh represent what has taken place spiritually. Whereas Paul wrote in Romans 12, uh, our lives become a parable of it, a picture of it. Uh, what has happened spiritually becomes evident in the flesh. We walk out our spiritual righteousness here in our flesh, here on this earth. And Paul says this is a profit process. If you, obf if you obfuscate these two doctrines, you might get the idea that you become sinless when you get reborn, but you do not. Paul wrote a whole chapter about us fighting sin as believers, as those who have been reborn. A whole chapter about believers struggling with and fighting sin. It's Romans, yes, Romans chapter 8. All the old is gone, everything's made brand new. Now, I, I use this as an example, is that if you knew Sean as the old Sean, you wouldn't recognize it as the new Sean. Total difference. Because in this side, I was in darkness. In this side, I was in sin. In this side, it was my nature. My nature, no matter how much I tried to be good, I would be evil. Because I'm not born again. We still have our nature. We are not delivered from our nature. That's what Romans 8 is about. In fact, one chapter earlier in chapter 7, Paul writes this. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now I think we can all agree that Paul was born again, a born again man with the sin nature. But, but as he writes on in chapter 8, there is no condemnation for those, what did he say? What, what did it say in Romans 8? There is no condemnation for those who do not sin. No, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. After he makes that statement, he goes on to talk about us fighting sin and becoming sanctified by the Holy Spirit here on the earth. Uh, so Paul was well acquainted with sin. Uh, he says it was still part of his nature as a reborn man. Uh, Christians still sin. Uh, John in 1 John said, any man who says he has not sinned or does not sin is a liar. And John is writing to Christians. Uh, in Galatians 2 uh, that uh, uh, Sean referenced, Peter sinned as a believer, as an apostle. As an apostle of Christ, his sin is put right there in the Bible. His sin of hypocrisy. It's documented right there in the book of Galatians. 
you find many people sitting in church, they confess Jesus, but they've never been born again. Let's just get that out of the way. Because we say, yo, but that guy sinned, or this woman sinned, or that did, or they did that kind of thing. No, they, they're not born again. Because if you're born again, though you might be doing things, there is a very thing of the Holy Spirit in your life telling you that's not who you are. What's the job of the Holy Spirit? Convict the world of sin. This side, convict you of righteousness. So the Holy Spirit never comes to you and say, Oh, evil JD, you have just messed up. You are the worst of the worst. No, he goes to JD and to me. What goes to JD? He goes to me. Sean, that's not who you are. Now, Paul knew who he was in Romans 7. Uh, he was a wretched man still under in, with the sin nature. And he was writing under direction of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, go figure. Uh, Paul said, hey, I've still got the sin nature. I'm a wretched man. These are the words of the Holy Spirit. But Sean says the Holy Spirit never convicts us of sin. He just, you know, comes and tells us what a good job we're doing and, and, and all this stuff. You are a child of God. He always brings you back to the Father. He always brings your nature. And because your nature's change, you repent immediately. You don't even go down that line. You immediately change because you are born again. Do you have everything always right? No. Sometimes you act in a carnal mindset. Sometimes you act stupid. The spirit of stupidity hits you. You're just stupid. But then the Holy Spirit comes and says, hey, hey, hey. That's not who you are. That's done with. You are now born again. He's going a long way around the word sin. And he, I mean, for believers, he's like, yeah, you know, the world sins. But believers, we just, you know, we just kind of like, uh, you know, we, we kind of have anxiety and, you know, stuff like that. Not Nothing too bad. But, you know, Paul used the word sin for himself. And the same word he used for the Gentiles when he called them a people of sin. Uh, Paul called himself a sinner. All the old is gone. Second Corinthians 5. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Therefore what? Christ died for all of his children, Jew and Gentile, man and woman, slave and free. We don't regard anyone according to the flesh, according to their lineage from Adam, but their lineage from Christ. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. No more Jew and Gentile, men and women, slave and free. Paul covers this a lot in his letters. It doesn't mean everything that used to happen to you doesn't happen anymore. We are reborn in Christ. In Him, we are a new cre creature, a, a new creation. Not in us, but in Him. Sanctification is the process by which we are made more like Him. We are in Him in the sight of God. We are being made like Him by God's Spirit here on the earth. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, the only way to be reconciled to God is to be in Christ, born in him, so to speak, placed in him. This is the doctrine of substitution and justification. It says, in him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off, cutting off, putting off. Listen to that word. By putting off, cutting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What is he using? I'm going to go into detail to understand the context of it. Circumcision was a mark in the flesh, cut off, thrown away. Spiritual circumcision, mark in the spirit, cut off, thrown away. The old circumcision represented the law. So it was a mark in the flesh that every Jewish man could be reminded that he is in a covenant with God. Every single day. 
this side, there's a reminder every single day. You are in a new covenant. The old has been cut off. Go back here. In the Old Testament, I don't want to hammer on this, but you need to get this. In the Old Testament, there was a reminder that it didn't exist anymore. I am part of a new covenant. I could not return in the natural and in the covenant to an old thing. He's obsessing over things that the Bible doesn't emphasize. You'll notice this with uh, teachers of heresy. They, they, they make a big deal out of little details because they have to make it seem like uh, they're people who see things in the Bible that nobody else can see. Uh, it's like, hey, they used a knife to circumcise people. Knives are sharp. And uh, back then they had like bone handles and, and Samson slayed the Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. So therefore the circumcision was meant to slay your enemies. And it, it's just dumb. So what is Paul talking about there in uh, Colossians 2? For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul realizes that he has been sent to the church to teach them something. What has he been sent to teach? He answers in chapter 1, just a few lines earlier. He says, now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission of God. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ uh, so powerfully works in me. This is the context. Paul is talking about one man being made out of two. Uh, God's people and the nations, Jews and Gentiles, people of the Old Testament and people of the New Testament. The mystery is revealed in Christ, and this is the mystery. God is reconciling a people to himself through his Son. And these are two people who are not even reconciled to each other. Uh, two people brought into one body. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, Paul was often concerned with the fact that after he would leave a church, people would come in and start undermining what he taught them, mainly uh, the mystery of the Old Testament revealed in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. They have the faith, the doctrine. Paul gave it to them. Abide in it in what you have been taught, no matter what anyone else tells you, no matter how persuasive they sound, how smart they sound, how right they sound. Remember the things you have been taught. Remember the faith. Remember the doctrine. Remember what is orthodox. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now, circumcision was the big issue in the early church, whether or not these Gentiles coming into the church had to be circumcised. Paul here is saying the Gentiles have already been circumcised. Well, in what sense? By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Putting off the body of sin, putting off Adam, putting off all the history of the Gentiles and their hatred of God, that is gone. Paul is not saying that we become sinless or that we cast aside our flesh and become spirits, but that those ordinances that were against the Gentiles, simply because they were Gentiles, are no longer in place. 
And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. Now think about all those things in the law written against the Gentiles. Think about the court of the Gentiles and the temple. They even they had to have their own place where they could go. They couldn't go anywhere else. Uh, all those things are gone. Uh, the Gentiles are being brought into the body. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, who has he made a spectacle of? Well, the devil, yes, but also the kings of this earth. Christ has come to power not through a sword, but through a cross. He has made a people out of every people. He has conquered the world. How many other kings have tried but failed and Christ succeeded and through the foolishness of a cross, as, uh, as Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 1. On this side, it's cut off. I cannot return to the old. I'll never again be part of the old. There is a mark in my spirit forever that I'm part of a new covenant. Forever there's a mark. The mark cannot be reversed. But the Greek was still Greek in his flesh, the Jew still a Jew. Christ did not erase these distinctions. When he says later that in Christ there is no Jew, no Greek, no barbarian, no males, no females, he does not mean that God has erased these distinctions. Uh, we're not genderless in Christ, nor are we without ethnicity. But what Paul is saying is that there are no ordinances against us in his body based on these distinctions. Because it's of better promises in Christ. If we understand what the cross is, we understand how part I am of God and how God is part of me. Uh, here we go. That, now that's twice he said that. I don't think it's a slip of the tongue. This has gone beyond problematic language into heresy. Once and for all, that old is gone. The new has come. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives. It's no longer in my ability, in his ability. It's no longer based on my faith. It's based on his faith. You making some sense? Now, that, that's a manipulation trick. I, what, what he's saying is, I'm telling you deep things here. I hope you're smart enough to keep up with me. Now, but now he, he's right in that our salvation, our justification is all based on the works of Christ, his righteousness. That's the orthodox doctrine. But he's about to deviate from orthodox doctrine. Buried with him in baptism which is also where we were raised in him through the faith uh, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So what were you baptized into? His death. You were baptized into his death so that what could happen? You could be raised into what? His life. That isn't a nice little thing. Let me explain. We put this off as a almost like a symbolic thing that happens but being born again we see as a very spiritual thing and a very real thing we, do, do you see your being born again as a symbolic thing I'm just scared to ask maybe you, maybe you answer me let me tell you it's not symbolic you are born again you are changed you are part of God and God is part of you now that's the third time he said that when Paul says he died with Christ that is what he means. He died with Christ. As far as God was concerned, the debt was paid. Paul owed God a life. Christ paid that debt. And this is a divine act of God to accept Christ's sacrifice for Paul, for me. It is God's doing. It's all God's doing. Justification is his doing. Sanctification is his doing. Glorification is his doing. There's nothing symbolic about it. It's not just a symbolic thing that you do. Say, Father, I give my life to you. Amen. Hallelujah. And now I'm, uh, I used to be a vegetarian and now I eat meat. I'm joking. Uh, so I used to eat meat. Now I'm vegan. Whatever. That's a, that's a shift of, 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 a, of a lifestyle. That didn't happen when you got born again. When you got born again, you were raised into Christ. But I'm not literally inside Christ. He's not like, like some aura that, that, that surrounds me. I, I'm covered by him, by his righteousness. This is what Paul taught in Romans 8. There's no condemnation for me because I'm covered by the life of Christ. How can God condemn me, condemn me when I'm covered by the life of his son? Now we get to this place. You were baptized into his death. 
that's not symbolic the day you got baptized. It's done in water just as much as it to, to, symbolizes, to symbolize the fact of a burying. But in the spirit, you died the day you got baptized in Christ. And the moment you came up out of the water, you got resurrected. Okay. This is more a manipulation. Now, y'all don't get this. Let me take my glasses off and see if I can explain it to you. The problem is the church do not understand resurrection because they're so focused, and I almost used the bad word, on this end. On the achter end. You can just say it in Afrikaans. They're so focused on the end that they forget there's a resurrection that has taken place because when Jesus was raised, you were not baptized into his birth so that you could be born. No, you were baptized into his death. So you were baptized into the resurrected Christ, not in the Christ before the cross. Woo. So, so Christ wasn't righteous before the cross? He, he's mincing words here to make it sound like he's got something nobody else knows. And you being dead in your trespasses, that was I was dead, an uncircumcision of your flesh, has been made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Now, the problem is, is that we are stuck in time. We're stuck in time and we think God is stuck there too. When God, when Jesus died as Christ in the earth, it was out of the very perspective of outside of time. If we read the book of Revelation, we understand that it says Jesus was crucified in Egypt before the foundation of the earth. Was Jesus ever crucified in Egypt? No. But he was crucified in a spiritual Egypt that was Israel because they brought everything back from Egypt. Let's, let's read the passage. It's Revelation 11.8. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. It's talking about the two prophets. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. So I don't know if this is the correct application Sean is making here or not. The text says that the city is called Sodom in Egypt, where the Lord was uh, uh, crucified. I, I don't know what that means. I'll be the first to uh, admit that. Um, but uh, so Sean says uh, he 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 says that uh, uh, Israel is spiritual Egypt because Israel always wanted to go back to Egypt. They had the spirit of Egypt or something like that. We'll just we'll just, we'll just go on. Verse fourteen. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. What was that? The law. Not the law. The laws of separation, such as circumcision. Remember the context here. Paul is talking about the new body Christ is making out of Jews and Gentiles. The new people. Before God had said, this people, the Jews, and no other. Uh, just the Jews. This is my people. Nobody else. These people. In fact, he says these Jews are to be uh, meticulously separate. They meticulously separate themselves from everyone else. He establishes a lot of ordinances of separation. But Paul says these are all now removed, not the whole law. We still have to obey the law. Paul wrote a whole chapter about how the Holy Spirit empowers us to obey the law in Romans 8. Everything that required you to be at your best to look your best, to do your best, to be. He said, I wiped it out. It was against you. You could never do it. He still requires us to, for example, not kill people. Well, that's the law. He's, he's flirting with the antinomianism. That's the belief that uh, there is no law. Now, he, he's teaching sinless perfectionism, but he's also teaching antinomianism. No law. Sinless perfectionism, that when we're saved, we become sinless. And antinomianism that there is no law. But you can see how these two go hand in hand, right? I mean, it's easy to be without sin when there's no law. So, so far we've got, uh, we've got Gnosticism, we've got some antinomianism, and uh, sinless uh, perfectionism. But the best is yet, well, I should say the, the worst is yet to come. So what does he say here in this context? All that was wiped out, cut off. Remember what we read? against us which was contrary to us and he has taken it out 
of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, I want to just explain this. When Jesus dies on the cross, he doesn't die clothed in your sin. Because then you would only be clothed in his righteousness. He died as sin. Wait, what, say what now? When Jesus dies on the cross, he doesn't die clothed in your sin. Because then you would only be clothed in his righteousness. I would only be clothed in his righteousness? Only be clothed in his righteousness. That, that's what he said. Poor me, I'm only clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Okay, um, go on, Sean. He died as sin. You've got to understand, God didn't come, and God was really angry at you, so he put you on that cross in Jesus, and he took all his anger out on that, and now that's... No, God hated sin because sin separated you from him. So Sean says God was upset at sin, not at me personally. But Jesus says in John 3.36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's why the doctrine of substitution is so important, why it's, it's taught in the scriptures. Uh, Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Not by taking the form of sin, but taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Not in the likeness of sin, but in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, not in sin form, but in human form, he hum humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Uh, he, he, Christ humbled himself by becoming one of us, and God exalted him. <clears throat> God didn't make him righteous because he became sin. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then Romans 8 again, there is there there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit and for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. He did not condemn us. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in Adam cannot please God. And that's why Jesus came in the flesh. He had to come in the flesh to die as our substitute. Uh, if it sounds like I'm getting angry, it's because this, this does <laughs> anger me. I mean, it's clearly taught in the scriptures. It's been taught by the church for 2,000 years. It's what Christians have believed for 2,000 years. When he died, he was holy and harmless and undefiled, completely separate from sinners. And that's not what the writer of Hebrews says, not what Paul says, not what John says, not what Jesus says. It's not what any writer of scripture says. Jesus was not guilty of murder. If he was guilty of murder, then he could not die for murderers, you see. I don't need a murderer to die to me, die for me. I don't need sin to die for me. I need someone to die for me. Someone in the flesh, in my flesh. Someone from Adam who can be my substitute to die my death. So he became sin. Well, well not Je Jesus is God. Because God in Christ Jesus reconciled the world unto himself. So he became, on that cross, the murderer. He didn't put murder on him. He became the murderer. He became the rapist. He became the molester. He became your fear. He became your insecurity. He became every single form of sin and every single sickness manifested on him. No, no, you, you know, for a price to be paid, it needs to be everything that was needed to pay. The greatest gospel verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin, sin for us.
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me unpack those 15 Greek words. He, God, made Jesus sin. What do you mean he made Jesus sin? Only in one sense. He treated him as if he had committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, though in fact he committed none of them. Hanging on the cross, he was wholly harmless, undefiled. Hanging on the cross, he was a spotless lamb. He was never for a split second a sinner. He is holy God on the cross. But God is treating him, I'll put it more practically, as if he lived my life. God punished Jesus for my sin, turns right around and treats me as if I lived his life. Amen. That's the great doctrine of substitution. And on that doctrine turned the whole reformation of the church. That is the heart of the gospel. So once and for all, he became all of that so you could become all his innocence. Wait. Your very nature is innocent. I'll let that sink in for a moment. Who we are in Christ is free. You're not 50% free. You're not 20% free. You're not 88% free. You are completely free. All of that is gone. Sin can never ever touch you again. Because it got cut away and dealt a blow. Oh, just listen to this quickly. Quickly, quickly. We're going to read this. Verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing. What did he do? Triumph over them um, in it. Well, them in it. So then it goes on about judgment and about festivals, and you can go read it. I don't have time to. Yada, yada, yada. I, I think you said enough, Sean. This is terrible. This is, this is heresy. Uh, we've got uh, Gnosticism, we've got um, uh, antinomianism, sinless perfectionism. Uh, we have a, 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 a heretical view. Of, well, no, there's no substitutionary atonement in this. There's none. Uh, there's there's no substitutionary atonement in this uh, teaching from Sean. And if there's no substitutionary atonement, there's no justification. And if there's no justification, there's no sanctification. If there's no sanctification, there's no glorification. If there's no glorification, there's no life for any of us. There's only death. There's only Adam. Christ died for me, yes. But he also died as me. This is what Paul means when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Uh, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Uh, Christ, when he was, uh, when he was mocked, they were, they were mocking me. I was mocked, and yet I felt no shame, right? Uh, when they pulled his beard out, that, that was my beard. My beard was yanked out, and yet here I am with a full beard, uh, when Christ was punched in the face, that was my face they were punching. And yet here I am without a blemish on my face. When he was scourged, tied to a post and scourged, those were my lashes that he received. And yet my back has no scars. When he was crucified, when he was put to death, that was me that they were putting to death. And yet I live. Why? Because he was my substitute. He was my substitute in the sight of God. And because of that, I can be declared righteous. Because my substitute was righteous. That's the doctrine of justification. Anything else is heresy. Sean Besson is a heretic. Uh, stay away from him. Oh, uh, I tell you, man, sometimes like <laughs> it messes with you because when you believe the gospel, when you believe the truth of the gospel, when he's put it in your heart to believe the way that we believe it, it really disturbs you when you when you hear things like this. And uh, I mean, I feel like icky now. It's not like uh, some of the goofy stuff that we look at where I just feel silly and like I've been, you know, um, you know, watching um, professional wrestling for two hours or something like that. This is like, it affects you. And so, uh, stay away from this man. Stay away from heretics. Cling to what is true doctrine. That's what doctrine means. True teachings. 
cling to what is true, cling to doctrine, cling to what is orthodox, and let everything else fall by the wayside. God bless y'all. Take care, and uh, I'll talk to you again soon.